Okay, it's after eight, so I think we should probably get going. Welcome to Neuro Ophthalmology Grand Rounds, I guess is what it's called. And um, uh, I think there'll be a little influx of uh, people coming from FEC. Uh, it's running over a little bit. I think that we're currently um, complaining about the EMR, so yay. And uh, I want to welcome everybody, and um, this is sort of an interactive forum. Uh, we have uh, three presentations today. Uh, the first is, uh, I think is on the list, was uh, Megan, I mean uh, Sarah. Are you up for us, Sarah? Um, yeah. yeah, Sarah Stone is going to be presenting uh, a case of neuroretinitis uh, that we happened upon. It's just a great case with a nice differential diagnosis and an actual diagnosis, which of course is always uh, a happy day in neuro-ophthalmology. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Sarah Stone is a neurology resident, PGY-4. Thank you. Oh. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Sarah Stone. I'm a PGY-4 adult neurology resident, and I'm going to be talking about neuroretinitis today. Um, so we'll start with a case. This is a case we saw in neuro ophthalmology clinic. Um, a 43-year-old woman uh, presented to neuro ophthalmology clinic um, for evaluation of vision loss uh, in her left eye. She initially reported that she was on a business trip in Seattle when she awoke with um, blurring of her central vision. Um, she thought it was related to her contact lenses, so she removed her contact lenses and sort of watched things for about a day, um, but her symptoms were persistent. Um, and then ultimately she described sort of a ring in her central vision that had a grayish or purple hue with some flashing lights and a sensation of movement within that ring. Um, she was evaluated by a local optometrist in Seattle and was told that she had optic nerve swelling and was started on treatment for this. Um, on additional history, um, she noted that she uh, carried a diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea as well as headaches with rare migraines. Um, for surgical history, she'd had three cesarean sections and a laparoscopic surgery for ovarian torsion during which her appendix was also removed. Um, she had no significant neurologic or ophthalmologic uh, family history. Um, she lives in Ogden, Utah with her husband and three children. Um, she works as a software salesperson and de denies any use of tobacco, alcohol, or illicits. Um, she doesn't take any regular medications and she did endorse an allergy to penicillins. On some additional questioning, she recalled that about three to four months prior to her symptom onset, she had been uh, traveling to coastal California with her family on a camping trip, um, and they had come across a stray cat, which they adopted and brought home with them. Um, about five weeks prior to presentation, um, she uh, remembered that she had had about a 24-hour febrile illness, which sort of just self-resolved. Um, and she didn't have any complications related to that. And then about two weeks prior to presentation, she noted that um, the family dogs had um, developed fleas and they were working vigorously with their vet to take care of these fleas. Um, so on that clinic visit, her initial exam was notable for 20-20 vision in the right eye and 20-50 vision in the left eye. Um, she had a 0 0.6 log uh, uh, relative afferent pupillary defect um, on the left. Um, she described a central scotoma with Amsler grid testing um, and was only able to recall correctly one of 11 Ishihara plates on the left eye. Um, her slit lamp exam was notable for a normal anterior chamber without any cells. And her fundoscopic exam, um, she showed um, three plus um, optic disc swelling on the left and a boggy appearing macula um, with a normal fundoscopic exam on the right. Additional testing in clinic that day included uh, Humphrey visual fields and OCT RNFL and OCT of the macula. Her visual fields are shown here and you can see that she has uh, central scotoma on the left. Sorry, it's not labeled left and right, but that's the left up there. Um, and then uh, her OCT um, RNFL showed diffuse thickening um, of the left on the left eye, 
and her macular OCT showed loss of foveal contour with subretinal uh, fluid and intraretinal deposits. Um, she also had an MRI brain in orbits that was contrasted and normal. Um, and her laboratory testing include, included uh, toxoplasma um, and Lyme serologies, RPR, quantiferon gold, and ACE, which were negative. Um, and then she also had um, Bartonella Hensley uh, serologies, which were positive. Um, the treatment that she had received in um, Seattle was doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice daily for an intended duration of four weeks. And then we also prescribed her a prednisone taper um, for her to initiate in the event that she had subjective worsening of her vision. Um, and she did take these um, prior to her follow-up visit, which was at uh, two weeks. Um, at her two-week follow-up uh, exam, she noted subjective improvement in her acuity in the left eye, and this was confirmed objectively, now with 20-30 vision in the left eye and an unchanged normal vision in the right eye. Um, her OCT RNFL um, showed, res uh, excuse me, her visual field showed resolution of her central scotoma in the left eye, and then her OCT RNFL and OCT of the macula were also quite improved. Um, and then on her fundoscopic exam, she had some minimal optic disc swelling superiorly and a well-formed macular star. Um, this is not her fundus photo, sorry. You look just like that. <laughs> okay, so this was all consistent with the diagnosis of uh, Bartonella neuroretinitis. So I'm just gonna spend a little bit of time talking about um, this entity. Uh, it was first described by Theodore Lieber in 1916, uh, who coined the term stellate maculopathy uh, based on the star-shaped appearance of the macula in these patients. Um, and the pathophysiology was later better characterized by uh, Donald Gass in 1977, who used fluorescein angiography um, to show that initially there's actually vascu increased vascular permeability at the optic disc and a secondary um, swelling that occurs at the macula. Um, he was the person who coined the term neuroretinitis to describe this constellation of findings. Um, optic disc edema with the macular star is not specific to neuroretinitis, so that's what, although that's what we think of. Um, it can also be seen with other ophthalmologic conditions, including hypertensive retinopathy, papilledema, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, diabetic papillopathy, um, and juxtapapillary tumors, as well as some toxic exposures. Um, and in these cases, the clinician has to use um, details from history, physical exam, and other diagnostic testing to delineate these diagnoses from neuroretinitis. Uh, neuroretinitis uh, mostly occurs in young adults who've uh, had a preceding viral illness, often respiratory in nature. Um, for the most part, uh, uh, vision changes are painless, although some patients do report some retrobulbar discomfort. Um, typically, the process is unilateral, though bilateral cases have been described, and in fact, there are cases of subclinical involvement of a fellow eye um, in these patients. They have reduced visual acuity um, with a central or uh, secocentral scotoma. Um, the relative afferent pupillary defect is variable and may depend a little bit on the timing of the patient's presentation. Um, optic disc edema occurs early in the disease course with um, de evolution of a macular star sort of throughout the disease course occurring a little bit later. And then uh, visual prognosis is quite favorable in these patients even uh, without treatment. Um, while infection typically comes to mind as um, a common cause of neuroretinitis, other etiologies have been uh, discovered. Um, so the infectious causes include bacterial, viral, protozoan, and fungal uh, microorganisms. Um, however, neuroretinitis has also been uh, described in association with a variety of inflammatory conditions, including um, sarcoidosis, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, um, polyarteritis nodosa, and then um, some other autoimmune uh, syndromes that also involve the eye, like ERVAN, idiopathic retinal vasculitis and neuroretinitis, and TINU syndrome, or tubulointerstitial nephritis and uveitis. 
Um, in cases where no uh, cause can be identified, um, neuroretinitis is termed idiopathic. And what in the percent of all cases are considered idiopathic? Um, I'm not sure. Sorry. Should, what are, we, are we talking 10 percent, half, 60 percent? Uh, I'd, I'd say about half. We all know what idiopathic means, don't we? Yeah. We're idiots. Yeah. <laughs> it's all, I mean, obviously, that, yeah. Okay. Um, so the recurrent idiopathic neuroretinitis has gained some interest in the literature. Um, there was a, a series of seven patients reported by Pervin et al. Um, who looked at these cases, and they proposed a possible <laughs> kind of autoimmune disc vasculitis as the etiology um, and recommended uh, consideration for chronic immunosuppression in those cases. So as you alluded to, not all idiopathic cases are idiopathic. Okay, um, so the most common identifiable cause of neuroretinitis is uh, disseminated cat scratch disease. Um, uh, you may recall from medical school that cat scratch disease uh, uh, starts with a bite or a scratch from a cat. That leads to kind of a cellulitis and uh, regional lymphadenopathy, occasional, occasionally lymphadenitis. Um, the, the disease can become disseminated, in which case patients um, will experience fevers, chills, myalgias, arthralgias, and then they can even develop things like endocarditis, pneumonia, um, osteomyelitis. Um, ocular Bartonella is not limited just to neuroretinitis. Other ophthalmologic conditions have been um, seen with ocular Bartonella, and these include um, uveitis, papillitis, choroiditis, endophthalmitis, um, optic disc granulomas, branch retinal um, arterial and venous occlusions, angiomatosis, and serous retinal uh, detachments. Um, as some of you may know, um, treatment for um, Bartonella neuroretinitis is somewhat controversial. Um, um, some studies have shown a potential benefit and some study, studies have shown no benefit. Um, and all of these studies are essentially retrospective. There's been no, to my knowledge, um, randomized clinical trials uh, to study this. Um, in 1998, Reed et al. retrospectively found that antibiotic therapy potentially shortened the duration for visual recovery. Um, and then in 2004, Rolaine et al. Um, recommended um, dual coverage for serious complications of Bartonella, including neuroretinitis. And then in 2012, Chi et al. retrospectively found no improvement with antibiotics, um, steroids, or the combination of both. Um, more recently, in a 2014 Point Counterpoint article in the Journal of Neural Ophthalmology, uh, Michael Lee proposed um, treatment for patients with severe vision loss, bilateral involvement, systemic symptoms, immunocompromised state, or protracted clinical course, um, while the opposing author, um, Tariq Bhatti, argued for no treatment as long as the patient um, is immunocompetent. Um, importantly, Bartonella can cause serious neurologic sequelae, which were particularly interesting to me. Um, there is a review that went through all of the cases in which neurologic complications of a disseminated cat scratch disease have been reported, and these cases included patients with meningitis, uh, encephalitis, seizures, um, demyelination in the form of acute disseminated encephalomyelitis or transverse myelitis, um, encephalitis lethargica, which is a, essentially a post-infectious Parkinsonism, um, and then also Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, in summary, uh, neuroretinitis etiologies uh, include infectious, inflammatory, and in some cases, idiopathic. Um, and the most commonly identified cause for neuroretinitis is Bartonella. Um, the treatment for Bartonella retin re neuroretinitis is controversial, and um, clinicians should be aware of kind of red flag symptoms that make an alternative diagnosis um, more likely. And then ocular Bartonella is, is not the only complication of disseminated cat scratch disease. There are other serious neurologic and medical complications that can occur. Okay. So now that we've resolved that, Judith, what do, do you recommend? Seeing as how ever since this article came out, in very recently, 
Right. Well, uh, in this particular instance, she had already been started on treatment and was fairly adamant that she was going to take prednisone, um, uh, whether I uh, gave her the prescription or otherwise. And uh, I, I think that um, uh, uh, at least she had been doing quite a bit of review of the literature and was fairly sure of the treatment course that she wanted to undergo. Uh, that's not always the situation, and there may be circumstances under which one might have a little more influence over what's going to be happening with the patient. But in this instance, she certainly had made uh, a careful review of the literature and made her own decisions. Uh, what, would you, what, what would you recommend on a the first case you make the diagnosis? Do you, do you generally recommend both uh, antibiotic treatment as well as uh, oral steroids? So I like the antibiotic treatment. I'm a lot more leery of the steroid treatment. And then the other one is, is it, and, and I'm not an ophthalmologist, but my understanding is that we call it an infectious, but no one has shown that the neuroretinitis itself is actually an infection. I mean, nobody has ever pulled out an infection. I mean, it'd be very hard to do, but no one right. has, has shown that this is not necessarily an immunological reaction to infection. Okay. So we really don't know if it's a true infectious etiology. Correct. Right? Correct. So, that's my understanding. Is that, that I, I believe that is still the case. In yes. fact, I think, I think the majority of people feel the neuroretinitis is probably not actual infection, that it's most likely an immune reaction. Correct. That's, That's my understanding. Yeah. Yes. How often is bilateral? Would you say that? Or? I think bilateral rare. is pretty rare. I've never seen it. Which is surprising. Which, if it is an immune reaction, is very interesting. Yeah. I'm very confused. It'll be interesting to see what happens. She did have a slightly, uh, it, it just clinically it didn't look abnormal, but on uh, OCT, her right optic nerve was a little on the full side. It'll be interesting to see what happens to that over time. I think that Sarah's point that there may be subclinical involvement in the other eye is very apt. Um, and of course, we're used to dealing with that sort of thing with optic neuritis as well. Uh, we certainly see you know, parainfectious optic neuritis. And, Especially in children, it is more likely to be bilateral than un under normal circumstances, but certainly not always. No. Well, your references are very thorough, but you did not include the uh, reference to the well-known neuro-ophthalmologist and rock headbanger, Ted Nugent, who sings about cat scratch fever. <laughs> 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 thorough, I think you should. We will definitely, in next week, we put a video in. Okay. That exactly <laughs> better, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Does Doxy Sy claim the antibiotic of choice for Bartonella? It is, yes. Did the, did the initial ophthalmologist know it was Bartonella? Yes. Yeah, yeah they, actually, it, was an op, it was an optometrist and an ophthalmologist in an emergency room and yeah. a neuro-ophthalmologist and, you know, yeah. so we didn't go on all those details. Yes. Yes. But yeah, they, they had, she had a pretty bang up evaluation in Seattle. She, when, when she came for follow-up, they were just managing to get the flea situation under control. <laughs> we're very lucky here in Utah that fleas do not prosper, so that's nice. Uh, any other questions? No? If not, I think we will move on. Thank you very much.